The Tsenkethi homeworld was destroyed, torn apart by civil war, as the two sides fought viciously over the last scraps on their dying planet, leaving almost nothing behind but ruin, radiation, toxic sludge, crumbled buildings, and the scattered broken bodies of a once proud alien race pushed to the edge of extinction. Jackson ducked down behind a collapsed pillar, taking shaky aim with his plasma rifle at the enemy soldier across the rubble-strewn battlefield that had once been a bustling city square. The soldier, wearing the red armor of the opposing faction, fired back, barely missing Jackson's head. Jackson squeezed the trigger and watched grimly as the plasma bolt struck the soldier in the chest, burning through his armor. The soldier crumpled to the ground, dead. Jackson lowered his rifle, looking around at the utter devastation surrounding him on all sides. The towering skyscrapers that had once gleamed proudly under the Tsenkithi sun were now nothing but skeletal ruins, their metal frames jutting up like the rib cages of long dead beasts. Thick clouds of acrid black smoke billowed into the ruined sky from the countless fires dotting the cityscape. The cracked streets were littered with rubble, debris, and the scorched corpses of fallen Senkethi soldiers from both sides. It was impossible to tell who was who anymore. Sporadic weapons fire and distant explosions echoed across the hellish landscape as the remnants of both armies continued to clash over the paltry resources remaining. Food, water, medicine, ammunition, all were in desperately short supply. But still the fighting raged on in final spasms of feudal bloodshed because to stop fighting meant the end. The end of their clans, the end of their people, the end of the entire Tsenkethi race. It hadn't always been this way. Jackson's grandfather used to tell him stories of the old days, when Tsenketh had been a lush, vibrant world, teeming with life and possessed of ample resources to provide for their growing population. There had been peace between the clans back then, too. All Tsenkethi united in building a prosperous future for their species. But as their numbers swelled, so too did discord between the ruling factions. Old rivalries and feuds began to resurface. Tsenketh's resources, once so plentiful, began to dwindle under the strain. The clans turned against each other in their desperate scramble for what remained. Tensions boiled over into protests, riots, and eventually all-out civil war. For thirty long years now, the war had raged across Tsenketh's surface, transforming the once verdant planet into a polluted, ash-choked wasteland. The weapons both sides unleashed grew ever more destructive, ripping deeper scars into their dying homeworld, even as they battled for control over its scraps. Until three days ago, when the unthinkable happened. The enemy had managed to detonate a planet-killer bomb, a massive device that ripped a chunk out of Tsenketh's crust and blasted millions of tons of irradiated dust into the atmosphere. The detonation incinerated most of the Tsenkethi population outright. Its deadly shockwave flattened most of the remaining cities. Radiation now poisoned the air, water, and soil. Lethal storms of toxic fallout swept across the ruined continents. The cataclysm had mortally wounded their world and doomed the Tsenkethi race to extinction, unless they received a miracle. With the last functional long-range transmitter, a distress signal had been sent out into the void, begging for the assistance of anyone who might be listening. A final desperate plea for salvation, for deliverance from the hell they'd made on their homeworld. But as Jackson limped through the corpse-choked streets back to the makeshift bunker serving as his faction's final outpost, he felt little hope of rescue. His armor was battered, his skin burned by radiation. The faceplate of his environment suit was cracked, letting in wisps of the toxic miasma saturating the air. He'd need a new suit soon, but there were none. Jackson knew his death by radiation poisoning was now inevitable, like so many of his kin. Help us, Jackson whispered to the uncaring, smoke-filled sky, not knowing that, impossibly, his prayer would soon be answered. Please, help us. Light years away, the human exploration vessel ESS Magellan's long-range sensors picked up an anomaly. An alien distress beacon, originating from an unexplored star system and broadcasting on Terran emergency channels. The message was garbled, but the meaning was clear. The unknown aliens were crying out for salvation from some cataclysm. 
On the Magellan's bridge, Captain Patrick Hill listened grimly to the looping transmission. He exchanged looks with his senior officers. They all knew what this meant. First contact with a new alien species, under the direst of circumstances. Helm, set course for the source of that signal. Maximum speed, Patrick ordered. Ready all med bays to receive alien casualties and prep the shuttle bays for search and rescue ops. If there's still someone alive on that world, we'll save as many as we can. As the Magellan leapt into warp, racing toward a devastated world and a dying species, Jackson hid in the shadows of a bombed-out HAB unit and wondered how many more days his people had left. He didn't know that their survival now depended on the boundless compassion of a strange alien race called humanity. The ESS Magellan dropped out of warp above a verdant blue-green world. Through the bridge viewscreen, Captain Patrick Hill gazed upon rolling forests and sparkling oceans. New Eden. A planet scouted for future human colonization, now the last hope for a dying alien race. Begin landing procedures, Patrick ordered. Get those prefab shelters deployed ASAP. As shuttles descended to the surface, Jackson pressed his faceplate against a viewport, drinking in the sight of his people's new home. After weeks in the sterile confines of the human ships, the lush world below seemed like paradise. On the ground, human work crews swarmed like ants, rapidly assembling modular structures. Power generators hummed to life. Water purifiers gurgled. By nightfall, a small city of prefab shelters stood ready to receive the Tsinkathi refugees. Jackson limped through the settlement, his enviro suit wheezing with each step. Though still weak from radiation poisoning, he'd taken charge of coordinating his people. He found Patrick overseeing the final touches on the medical facility. Your engineers work fast, Jackson said. Patrick nodded. We've had practice with emergency colonization. How are your people holding up? They're adjusting. It's difficult after losing everything. In the following days, human doctors tended to radiation burns and other injuries. Quartermaster crews distributed food, clothing, and other essentials. Jackson worked tirelessly alongside Patrick, helping his fellow Tsenkethi adapt to their new circumstances. But not all accepted human charity gracefully. Zoltan, a grizzled veteran of the Civil War, glowered as he watched crates of supplies being unloaded. Look at us, he growled to his followers. Reduced to begging scraps from aliens. Where's our pride? Our warrior spirit? That night, Zoltan's crew slipped into supply depots, pilfering weapons and equipment. They stockpiled their ill-gotten gains in hidden caches throughout the settlement. Jackson caught wind of the thefts from worried colonists. With growing dread, he realized some of his own people were plotting against their saviors. He found Patrick in the command center, poring over settlement schematics. We have a problem, Jackson said. He detailed Zoltan's activities, the weapons hoarding, the whispers of uprising. Patrick's face grew grim. If they start a fight here, it could undo everything we've accomplished. Agreed. We need to confront them directly, before this escalates further. They spent the next day discreetly investigating, identifying Zoltan's co-conspirators and locating their weapon caches. When they had enough information, Patrick called for a meeting of all Tsenkethi leaders. The prefab conference room crackled with tension as Patrick laid out what they'd discovered. Zoltan, caught red-handed, snarled defiance. We won't live as pets or slaves, he shouted. We'll take what we need and forge our own path. And doom us all in the process, Jackson countered. He turned to address the assembled Senkethi. Our people stand on the brink of extinction. We can't afford to fight amongst ourselves or reject the helping hand that's been extended to us. Patrick stepped forward. We didn't come here to conquer or control you. We came to give you a chance at a new beginning. Work with us, and together we can build something greater than either of our peoples could achieve alone. As debate raged between the factions, the fate of two species hung in the balance. Patrick and Jackson exchanged a tense glance, knowing that everything depended on finding common ground. The conference room erupted into chaos. Zoltan banged his hand on the table, his voice rising above the din. 
You call this salvation? We're nothing but pets to these aliens. Other Tsenkithi leaders joined in, their shouts filling the air. We won't be slaves. Death before dishonor. Patrick raised his hands, trying to restore order. Please, everyone. We're not here to rule you. We want to help you rebuild. Jackson stood beside him, addressing his fellow Tsenkethi. Look at what we've accomplished already. The shelters, the food. We can't do this alone. Weakness, Zoltan spat. You'd have us forget our warrior ways, become soft under human care. Patrick stepped forward. You lack the resources to survive on your own. Refusing aid now would only lead to more suffering. He's right, Jackson added. Adaptation isn't weakness. It's how we'll overcome this crisis and thrive again. Some of the moderates nodded, murmuring among themselves. But Zoltan's eyes blazed with fury. He stood, chair scraping across the floor. I won't live as a human puppet. Come, brothers. We'll forge our own path. With that, Zoltan stormed out, a group of hardliners following in his wake. In the days that followed, tension hung over the settlement like a storm cloud. Zoltan and his followers retreated to the outskirts, isolating themselves from the rest of the community. Meanwhile, Jackson threw himself into the work of building their new home. He labored alongside humans, erecting prefab structures and tilling fields for crops. Slowly, cautiously, bonds began to form between the two species. One evening, as the sun set over New Eden, Jackson wiped sweat from his brow and surveyed their progress. Patrick approached, offering him a canteen of water. You've done good work here, Patrick said. Your people are starting to come around. Jackson nodded, but his expression remained troubled. Not all of them. Zoltan is still out there, planning who knows what. Before Patrick could respond, an explosion rocked the settlement. Alarms blared as figures emerged from the shadows, weapons raised. It's Zoltan, Jackson shouted. He's attacking. Chaos erupted as Zoltan's insurgents clashed with human security forces. Plasma bolts sizzled through the air. The crack of gunfire echoed off prefab walls. Patrick and Jackson found themselves pinned down behind a supply crate. We need to end this, Patrick yelled over the din of battle. They fought their way through the settlement, rallying defenders as they went. Rounding a corner, they came face to face with Zoltan himself. For a moment, the three stood frozen, weapons leveled at each other. Jackson's heart pounded as he stared down his former countrymen. Zoltan, please, Jackson pleaded. This madness has to stop, for the sake of our people, our future. Zoltan's eyes narrowed, his finger tightening on the trigger. Our future died with our world. I'll not see the last of the Tsenkethi become human lapdogs. Patrick tensed beside Jackson, ready to fire. But Jackson knew that if they struck Zoltan down, it would only deepen the divide among their people. Everything they'd worked for would crumble. In that moment, with the fate of two species hanging in the balance, Jackson realized a terrible choice lay before them, one that would shape the future of New Eden and determine whether the Tsenkethi would rise from the ashes or be consumed by their own hatred. Jackson's finger trembled on the trigger. Zoltan stood before him, eyes blazing with hatred. For a heartbeat, time seemed to freeze. Please, old friend, Jackson pleaded one last time, don't make me do this. Zoltan's response was to raise his weapon higher. Traitor, he spat. Jackson fired. The plasma bolt struck Zoltan in the shoulder, spinning him to the ground. His weapon clattered away. All around them, the sounds of battle began to fade. Insurgents, seeing their leader fall, threw down their arms. Human security forces moved in, securing prisoners. Captain Patrick Hill strode up, flanked by his officers. Good work! he told Jackson. We'll take it from here. Jackson watched numbly as Zoltan and his lieutenants were led away in restraints. The fight had lasted mere minutes, but felt like a lifetime. Later, standing before the assembled Senkethi, Jackson's voice rang out. What happened today shames us all. We came here to rebuild, not tear ourselves apart. Murmurs rippled through the crowd. Jackson continued. The humans offer us a future. Without them, we have nothing. 
it's time to set aside old hatreds and embrace a new path, together. Slowly, heads began to nod. The mood shifted from shame to cautious hope. In the days that followed, the settlement bustled with renewed activity. Human work crews, now joined by Tsenkethi laborers, raised gleaming structures of metal and polymer. The scent of tilled earth filled the air as new fields were planted. Inside a newly built cultural center, a human linguist patiently explained Terran idioms to a group of fascinated Tsenkethi. Nearby, a Tsenkethi elder demonstrated traditional crafts to attentive human students. Jackson and Patrick stood atop a hill, surveying it all. We've come a long way, Patrick observed. Jackson nodded. There's still much to do, but for the first time since we lost our world, I feel true hope. The moment was shattered by a priority alert from Patrick's communicator. They rushed to the command center, where grim-faced technicians huddled around sensor readouts. Report, Patrick barked. Long-range sensors have detected a massive object on direct intercept course with New Eden, an officer replied. Initial estimates put it at over a 100 kilometers in diameter. Sir, it's big enough to render the entire planet uninhabitable on impact. Jackson felt the blood drain from his face. After everything they'd been through, after all they'd built, to face extinction once more. He turned to Patrick, saw the same shock and dedication mirrored in the human's eyes. Whatever came next, they would face it as allies, as friends. Options? Patrick demanded. And with that single word, the fight for New Eden's survival began. Options? Patrick demanded. The command center erupted into frenzied activity. Technicians' fingers flew across control panels as they analyzed the incoming threat. Jackson leaned over a holographic display, his face bathed in its blue glow. We need to hit it hard and fast, Jackson said, pointing to the asteroid's projected path. Our ship's weapons alone won't cut it. Patrick nodded, his heart made. What do you propose? The Tsenkathi ordinance we salvaged. If we can couple it with your vessel's propulsion systems, we might have a shot. It's risky, Patrick said, but it's our best chance. Let's do it. They sprung into action. The hangar bay became a hive of activity as human and Senkethi crews worked side by side. Welders sparked as they affixed bulky Senkethi munitions to sleek human spacecraft. Engineers rewired control systems, sweat beating on their brows as they raced against time. Jackson supervised a team attaching a massive warhead to the hull of a shuttle. He wiped grime from his face, glancing at the countdown timer on his wrist. How's it looking over there? He called to a human technician. Almost done, she replied, sealing the last connection. These babies pack one hell of a punch. As they worked, Patrick coordinated evacuation plans. If this doesn't work... We'll need to get as many people off-world as possible, he told his officers. Prep the remaining ships for emergency launch. Hours ticked by. The asteroid loomed larger in the sky, a menacing black mass blotting out the stars. Finally, the makeshift fleet was ready. Patrick and Jackson stood on the bridge of the lead ship. Through the view screen, they watched the rest of the fleet take up firing positions. All ships report ready, the tactical officer announced. Patrick and Jackson exchanged a look. This was it. Fire, they said in unison. A barrage of missiles streaked towards the asteroid. For a moment, nothing happened. Then explosions blossomed across its surface. Cracks spiderwebbed outward from the impact points. Again, Jackson shouted. Another volley slammed into the rock. This time, huge chunks began to break away. Cheers erupted on the bridge as the asteroid's core finally gave way, shattering into smaller pieces. But their elation was short-lived. A large fragment continued on its collision course with New Eden. We can't let that hit, Patrick said, his voice grim. Even a piece that size could devastate the planet. Jackson's eyes hardened with determination. We'll have to ram it. They quickly devised a plan. Two ships would be sacrificed their engines overloaded to provide maximum impact. I'll pilot the first ship, a human officer volunteered. And I the second, Hudson Kethy added. Patrick clasped their shoulders. 
your bravery will not be forgotten. The two ships rocketed towards the asteroid fragment. The first slammed into it at incredible speed, altering its course. Moments later, the second ship struck, providing the final push needed to divert it away from New Eden. On the bridge, Patrick and Jackson watched in stunned silence as the remains of the asteroid tumbled harmlessly into deep space. They had done it. They had saved their new home. As the reality of their victory sank in, Patrick turned to Jackson. We couldn't have done this alone, he said softly. Jackson nodded, his eyes shining with emotion. Together, there's nothing we can't overcome. They gazed out at the stars, no longer feeling like two separate species, but as one united people. The future of New Eden stretched before them, full of promise and possibility. The dust settled on New Eden as the last fragments of the asteroid threat faded into the void of space. Patrick and Jackson stood atop a hill, surveying the settlement below. The scars of recent battle were still visible, but so too were the seeds of something new. We did it, Patrick said, his voice tinged with awe. Together. Jackson nodded, his scaled skin catching the light of the alien sun. This is just the beginning. In the weeks that followed, plans took shape. Architects and engineers from both species huddled over hollow displays, arguing passionately about load-bearing structures and aesthetic flourishes. The foundation of their new capital would blend the best of both worlds. As the first beams rose from the earth, cultural exchange flourished. In a makeshift dojo, a grizzled Tsenkethi veteran barked orders at human recruits. No, 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 he growled. The Cuthark stance is about balance. Feel the ground beneath you. Become immovable. Nearby, a human artist guided Senkethi students through the basics of watercolor painting. See how the pigments blend? She explained. It's about capturing the essence of your subject, not just its form. Months passed. The city grew, its spires reaching for the sky. Then came an unexpected discovery. A exploration rover, scanning a nearby mountain range, detected unusual readings. Patrick and Jackson personally led the follow-up expedition. As they crested a ridge, Jackson's eyes widened. By the ancient gods, he breathed. Before them lay a vast deposit of shimmering ore. Within days, a joint mining operation was underway. Human excavators carved into the rock while Tsenkethi workers their bodies uniquely adapted to the harsh conditions, extracted the precious minerals. The fruits of their labor fueled the city's growth. Gleaming towers of metal and stone rose from the desert floor. Gardens bloomed in climate-controlled domes. Defense turrets stood silent sentinel, a reminder of the dangers that still lurked beyond their haven. Finally, after eighteen grueling months, it was finished. Patrick and Jackson stood before a sea of faces, human and Sankethi alike. A great banner hung behind them, waiting to be unfurled. Today, Patrick began, his voice carrying across the crowd, we christen not just a city, but a new beginning. Jackson stepped forward. Let this place stand as a testament to what we can achieve when we stand as one. Together they pulled the cord. The banner fell away, revealing the name etched in stone. Providence. Cheers erupted from the assembled throng. As the celebration raged into the night, bonds deepened. A human technician and Tsenkethi warrior found common ground over a shared love of strategy games. A Tsenkethi elder regaled wide-eyed human children with tales of his homeworld. Years passed. Providence flourished. In a classroom, a young girl, her skin a mottled mix of human and Tsenkethi features, raised her hand. Teacher, she asked, what does it mean to be human, or Tsenkethi? The instructor smiled. It means we're all part of something greater, something new. Deep beneath the city, in cavernous labs, a new discovery sparked excitement. Patrick and Jackson pored over readouts, their eyes gleaming with possibility. These xenometric compounds... Patrick mused. They could revolutionize our propulsion systems. Jackson nodded. We could reach the stars, find new worlds. The plan took shape quickly. They would transform one of the old colony ships, 
outfitted with technology beyond anything they'd dreamed possible. As work on the Intrepid began, anticipation built. In a ceremony aboard the refitted vessel, Patrick took his place on the bridge. Beside him stood Jackson, his oldest friend and now fellow explorer. Ready? Patrick asked. Jackson grinned, revealing pointed teeth. Always. As the Intrepid's engines hummed to life, carrying the hopes and dreams of two species, Patrick couldn't help but feel a sense of wonder. They had come so far, overcoming. The cavernous engineering bay of the UES Intrepid thrummed with energy as human and Senkithi technicians worked in tandem, their movements synchronized after months of preparation. Chief Engineer Sarah Chen wiped sweat from her brow as she examined a holographic readout of the antimatter containment field. Containment at 99.9% .9 efficiency, she called out, initiating final power transfer to the warp core. Beside her, Kazoth, her Tsenkithi counterpart, monitored the delicate balance of matter and antimatter. His scaled fingers danced across the control panel, making minute adjustments. Annihilation rate stable, Kazoth reported, his voice a low growl. We're ready for full power, Sarah. In the bridge, Patrick Hill stood before the main view screen, watching as the last of the crew boarded. The massive ship, once a symbol of humanity's exodus, now represented a new era of cooperation and exploration. Jackson entered, his reptilian eyes scanning the bridge before settling on Patrick. Pre-flight checks are complete. We're ready to make history. Patrick nodded, a mix of excitement and trepidation coursing through him. He keyed the shipwide calm. Attention all hands, this is Captain Hill. Prepare for launch sequence. Outside, the gathered citizens of Providence watched with held breath as the Intrepid's engines flared to life. The ship rose gracefully from its berth, ascending through the atmosphere. As they breached New Eden's ionosphere, Patrick gave the order. Engage warp drive. The view outside the bridge windows stretched and distorted. In a flash of brilliant light, the Intrepid surged forward, leaving their adopted home far behind. Hours later, the ship dropped out of warp. The bridge crew leaned forward, eager for their first glimpse of uncharted space. Sensors online, reported Lieutenant Amelia Durand, her fingers flying across her console. Multiple planetary bodies detected. Wait, sir, you need to see this. A holographic display materialized in the center of the bridge, showing a solar system teeming with potentially habitable worlds. Jackson's eyes widened. By the ancient gods, he breathed. We never dreamed. Patrick studied the display, his mind racing with possibilities. He turned to his first officer, Dr. Elena Rodriguez. Recommendations? Elena pointed to a blue-green orb. Kepler... 186F. Atmosphere and gravity within acceptable parameters. It's our best bet for initial exploration. Patrick nodded. Set a course, Helm. Let's see what's out there. As the Intrepid accelerated towards its new destination, Patrick caught Jackson's eye. No words were needed. The magnitude of their achievement was written plainly on both their faces. They had transcended the boundaries of their own star system, and with it, the old divisions between their peoples. The bridge hummed with activity as the crew prepared for their approach to Kepler-186F. Outside the viewscreen, the stars streaked by, each one a testament to the incredible journey that had brought them to this moment. The Intrepid's bridge fell silent as the viewscreen displayed the nightmarish hellscape of Kepler-186F. Ash and soot choked the atmosphere, obscuring the devastation below. Sensor readings scrolled across auxiliary displays, painting a grim picture of toxic compounds and radiation levels far beyond safe limits. My God, Patrick whispered, his face pale in the sickly glow of the screens. It's worse than we imagined. Jackson leaned forward, his scaled hands gripping the edge of a console. We can't turn back now. The scientific value alone. Patrick nodded grimly. Agreed. But we proceed with extreme caution. Dr. Rodriguez... Begin prepping the biohazard teams. In the launch bay, two dropships stood ready. Human technicians sealed Dr. Keller into her biodefense suit, the material hissing as it pressurized. Nearby, 
Battlemaster Kurvax barked orders to his Tsenkithi warriors as they performed last-minute weapons checks. Remember, Keller shouted over the whine of engines powering up, we're here to observe and collect data. No unnecessary risks. The dropships plunged through Kepler 186F's turbulent atmosphere. Keller's nuchals tightened as she gripped her restraints, the craft bucking violently. With a bone-jarring thud, they touched down on alien soil. As the hatch opened, acrid air assaulted their sensors. The landscape before them was a twisted mockery of life. Pulsating masses of fungal growth covered every surface, writhing tendrils reaching skyward. Spore contamination detected, a technician announced, his voice tight with worry. Initiating emergency resealing procedures. The teams fanned out, boots squelching in the fungal muck. Keller's scanner chirped incessantly as she collected samples, each reading more alarming than the last. The rate of mutation is off the charts, she muttered. This stuff's evolving faster than anything we've ever seen. A shout from Kravax's team drew their attention. In the distance, colossal spires of fungal growth towered over the landscape, pulsing with an otherworldly glow. As they approached, Keller's breath caught in her throat. Embedded within the structures were unmistakable alien forms, the remnants of Kepler, 186F's fallen civilization. By the ancestors! Kurvax growled, his voice thick with revulsion. They've been consumed. A piercing beep cut through the air. Keller's eyes widened as she studied her scanner. Life signs, weak but definitely there. We need to investigate. Pushing through a thick wall of fungal growth, they entered a dark, damp chamber. In the sickly glow of their suit lights, they saw them, the last survivors of Kepler 186F. Alien forms huddled together their bodies wasting away as the xenofungus consumed them from within. Keller fought back bile as she collected tissue samples. We, we can't help them, she choked out. But maybe we can learn enough to prevent this from happening again. As spores continued to accumulate on their suits, the order came to abort. The teams raced back to their dropships, decontamination procedures already beginning as they lifted off. Back on the Intrepid, Patrick and Jackson received the mission report in grim silence. The weight of what they'd witnessed hung heavy in the air. Conventional methods won't be enough, Patrick said, his voice hollow. We need something more. Extreme. Jackson met his gaze, understanding dawning in his reptilian eyes. What do you have in mind? Patrick took a deep breath, steeling himself. I have a plan. It's desperate, maybe even crazy, but it might be our only shot. Patrick leaned over the holographic display, his eyes scanning the swirling crimson clouds enveloping Kepler 186F. He turned to Dr. Keller and Battlemaster Carvax, their faces illuminated by the eerie glow. We have no choice, Patrick said, his voice heavy. The xenofungus will consume everything if we don't act now. Dr. Keller's fingers tightened around her data pad. The ethical implications are staggering, Captain. We're talking about unleashing a mutagenic agent on a planetary scale. Kervax's scaled skin rippled as he considered the options. And if we do nothing, Doctor? How many worlds might fall to this scourge? Silence fell over the briefing room. Patrick activated a secondary display, revealing schematics for the biocide dispersal system. Our labs have been working on this compound since we first encountered hostile xenobiology. It's designed to target specific cellular structures unique to non-terrestrial organisms. In the ship's bioweapons lab, technicians in sealed hazmat suits carefully manipulated robotic arms, synthesizing the lethal compound. Nearby, the low hum of industrial replicators filled the air as they fabricated specialized ordnance shells. Jackson strode into the hangar bay, where his Tsenkethi warriors prepped a fleet of heavily armored dropships. He ran a clawed hand along the hull of the lead craft, feeling the thrum of its engines. Warriors of the Tsenkethi Imperium, Jackson called out, his voice carrying across the bay. Today, we fight an enemy unlike any we've faced before. The fate of worlds hangs in the balance. The dropships streaked through Kepler 186F's turbulent upper atmosphere, their hulls glowing from the friction. 
at precisely calculated coordinates, bay doors snapped open. Bioside canisters tumbled free, detonating in brilliant flashes of crimson light. On the Intrepid's bridge, the crew watched in tense silence as the crimson cloud spread across the planet's surface. Lieutenant Duran's fingers flew across her console, analyzing incoming data. Bioside saturation at 63% and climbing, she reported. No immediate effect on the xenofungus detected. Minutes ticked by. Patrick paced the bridge, every muscle in his body taut with anticipation. Suddenly, Duran's console erupted in a cacophony of alerts. Sir, massive cellular destabilization detected in the fungal biomass. The view screen zoomed in on a sprawling fungal city. Before their eyes, the pulsating structures began to wither and collapse. Vast swathes of xenofungal growth blackened and crumbled to ash. For days, the intrepid maintained its vigil. They watched as the last vestiges of the alien infestation fought a losing battle against the relentless biocide. Finally, as Kepler-186F's skies began to clear, Patrick gave the order. Dr. Keller, you have a go for planetfall. Let's see what's left down there. A heavily shielded shuttle descended through wisps of dissipating crimson haze. As the hatch opened, Dr. Keller stepped onto alien soil. Her team fanned out, scanners probing the barren landscape. My God! Keller breathed, kneeling to examine a twisted piece of metal protruding from the scorched earth. This isn't natural formation. It's... it's a building foundation. Back on the Intrepid, Patrick and Jackson pored over the incoming data. Fragments of alien writing, glimpses of advanced technology, all hinted at a civilization lost to the xenofungal plague. We need to know more, Patrick said, his eyes gleaming with curiosity. What secrets are buried here? What advancements might we uncover? Jackson nodded, already formulating plans. I'll begin fortifying our position on the surface. We'll need a proper base of operations for what comes next. As the sun set on Kepler-186F, casting long shadows across the scarred landscape, the true scope of their discovery began to unfold. This was more than just a rescue mission now. It was the dawn of a new era of exploration and discovery. The acrid stench of ozone and charred metal assaulted Patrick's nostrils as he emerged from the crumbling remains of the command bunker. His ears rang from the catastrophic detonation that had rocked Kepler-186F to its core. Dust and ash choked the air, obscuring the devastation that stretched as far as the eye could see. Dr. Keller! Patrick called out, his voice hoarse. Dr. Rodriguez, anyone! A muffled groan answered him. Patrick scrambled over a pile of twisted debris, ignoring the sharp edges that tore at his uniform. He found Dr. Keller trapped beneath a fallen support beam, her face pale and streaked with blood. Hold on, Patrick grunted, straining to lift the beam. With a final burst of effort, he heaved it aside and helped Keller to her feet. The, the overseer, Keller gasped, clutching her side. Is it? Patrick's gaze drifted skyward. Where the monstrous entity had loomed moments ago, only a shimmering, distorted patch of space remained, a cosmic scar left by forces beyond human comprehension. Gone, Patrick whispered, for now. More survivors began to emerge from the ruins. Senkethi warriors, their scales scorched and cracked, limped alongside human scientists. The shared ordeal had stripped away any lingering barriers between the species. Dr. Rodriguez stumbled toward them, her lab coat in tatters. Captain, she said, her voice quavering. I've been monitoring the long-range sensors, the energy signature. It's dissipated, but there are echoes, fluctuations. I don't think we've seen the last of it. Patrick nodded grimly. We need to regroup, assess our situation. How many made it? A quick head count revealed the brutal truth. Of the hundreds who had been part of the expedition, barely two dozen remained. The price of their survival took a toll on Patrick's shoulders. In the shadow of a partially collapsed research dome, the survivors gathered. Humans and Senkethi alike bore the haunted looks of those who had glimpsed cosmic horrors beyond mortal understanding. What do we do now? A young technician asked, his voice cracking. 
Patrick surveyed the ragged group. We survived, he said firmly. Against impossible odds. Against forces that should have annihilated us completely. We owe it to those we've lost. To Jackson and his warriors. To push forward. Dr. Keller held up a battered data core. We still have the information we uncovered. The overseer, the extinction filters, the fate of countless civilizations. We can't let this knowledge die here. A Tsenkithi warrior, his crest torn and bleeding, stepped forward. Our ship is gone. Our greatest warriors lost. But we will stand with you, humans. Our fates are bound together now. Patrick nodded, a flicker of hope igniting in his chest. Then we rebuild, we fortify, and we prepare. The Overseer may return, or there may be other cosmic horrors waiting in the dark between the stars, but we'll face them together. As the group dispersed to salvage what they could from the ruins, Patrick found himself drawn back to the eerie grav scar that marred the sky. The secrets of the universe, terrible and wonderful, lay just beyond their grasp. And somewhere out there, the Overseer waited, an incomprehensible force that would one day return to test them anew. The path ahead was fraught with danger and uncertainty. But as Patrick watched humans and Tsenkithi working side by side, he knew that together they stood a chance of forging a future among the stars, no matter what cosmic challenges awaited them. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel. And for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.